Hi, everybody. Uh, just, just to explain that I am the curator of collections for the West Midlands for English Heritage. Yes, and you saw my title, which I neglected to. Uh, Defense Against the Eagle Eye, Evidence for Magic at Roman Rossiter. So uh, a bit of background. Um, here is a, uh, a, a map. I will point you to uh, Rossiter, which is uh, conveniently located at the head of Watling Street as it comes up from London, heading inexorably toward North Wales and Anglesey, uh, and we know what they had in mind there, the conquest of North Wales. Uh, the fort at Roxeter was established by the late 40s AD, and its layout, its gridded layout, was subsequently used as the basis of a major town at the end of the century. The civic <coughs> buildings there were finished by the end of the second century AD, and the uh, fullest extent of the defenses enclosed 78 hectares. And we can see uh, clear evidence of the intensity of use uh, from uh, a radiometry survey um, showing negative features. Um, and Roxeter was latterly the fourth largest city in Roman Britain. Uh, this is the English Heritage Monument there. I think probably many people have been there. Um, what is displayed is Insula 5. Um, the, bar, the, the uh, famous uh, groundbreaking Phil Barker excavations on the site of the Baths Basilica, the huge exercise hall uh, adjacent to Graham Webster's excavations of the, uh, the Baths Suite, the McCallum uh, Tavern, and uh, Latrine. And the material from these two excavations comprises the largest single collection held by English Heritage. We are working towards a redisplay of the site within the next five years, and I've been undertaking lots of new research in anticipation of the project, one strand of which has been a consideration of the evidence for magic there in the Roman period, and this has recently been published in the transactions of the Shropshire Archaeological and Historical Society. The evidence principally takes the form of amulets, and this is a section of classic examples from the early Roman period at Roxeter, all using images of the phallus. Uh, the use of amulets, of course, is of great antiquity. An amulet has protective properties based on the material from which it is made and or the symbolism of its imagery, and generally they were worn or carried on the body by the owner because physical contact was important. The use of amulets in Roman Britain is a Roman import, and before the Romans, they had been used extensively and popularized by the Egyptians. Amulets are one form of magic, and magic is a set of techniques by which an individual seeks to directly influence the course of events without having to seek divine intervention. One of the most frequent uses of magic in the Roman period was for defending oneself against the evil eye, a superstition that was also a Roman import into Britain, and which was much written about in the sources of, an, sources of an antiquity by authors like Pliny and Plutarch. The evil eye is a malign force thought to be transmitted by, by the eye of an envious beholder. It was held responsible for virtually all the disappointments and losses in life. Who gave the evil eye? The envious, also witches, but it was alarmingly random. People could possess the evil eye without realizing it, and could therefore give it unintentionally. You could even give it to yourself via a mirror. Foreigners and people with deformations of the eye were also thought to be likely to possess the evil eye. The mechanism of its transmission is specifically from eye to eye, from the eye of the giver of the curse into the eye of the recipient of the curse. And it is this method of transmission that informs the various techniques for defending oneself against it. One principal defensive strategy was the use of the eye catching, or use of eye catching <coughs> imagery, most often the phallus, often used in conjunction with the mano fica, the fig hand. This is a gesture combining the powerful male fist, which is at the same time made to resemble a vulva, by the insertion of the thumb between the second and the third fingers, resulting in a recognizable representation of the act of sex. This combination with the phallus and the mano fica is strongly associated with the Roman army. These graphic images were meant to provide a distraction to the evil eye sufficient to divert it before it reached one's own eye. All the two of the early military period amulets from the town center were designed to be mounted onto horse trappings. 
And this can be seen from the manner of their fixings. Um, so, so I have suggested that these were attached for the use of toggles. Uh, we see these, uh, these rather large um, holes, uh, which make them unlikely to have been hung around the neck. And here we see this is clearly meant to be <coughs> applied to, to some flat surface. Um, there are five in this linear form, four in bone and one in copper alloy, so we have a sort of hierarchy of cost. Uh, and to have so many identical examples indicates that these were used by the cavalry. Uh, we can see an obvious location on the horse's headpiece for this uh, round uh, disc ithyphallic mount. Um, and as I've said, the long flat amulets would have been attached to, uh, for example, the cheek straps. Though most amulets are for use by people, here we see the valuable horse standing as proxy for its owner. And it is significant that the amulets were located close to the wearer's own eye, the horse or the person, the proximity making it easier to interrupt the evil eye in its trajectory. There are a number of these, uh, these flat mounts uh, known in Britain and a few on the continent, and they do sometimes occur in groups, such as the famous group from Catterick, which vary slightly to this form. These amulets were probably part of, uh, probably an informal piece of insignia, as if they were a requisite bit of kit, they might occur more frequently. Here we see a group of slightly later amuletic mounts, all for horse harness, dating to the early civilian period. These are unprovenanced metal detector finds, probably from the general area of Roxford's livestock market. Though the animals were almost certainly still owned by men, the images seen in this group are of female genitalia. They still provide shock value, but it's more subtle. But because of the shape, they also resemble an eye. And this is the other main strategy used against the evil eye, the decoy eye. We see a clear change from the use of the phallus for horse amulets, even though phallic imagery was never specific to the military. Why is this? In a modern context, at the extreme end of the spectrum, it is illegal to adopt full military uniform and try to pass as service personnel. However, the wearing of army surplus has been very popular at times. When I was digging in the 1980s, loads of people on excavations wore army jackets. All those useful pockets, so affordable, and army boots as well. But occasionally an individual would take it further and adopt gaiters to the general amusement of the other site staff. It seems that it is easy here to trip over an invisible line and become ridiculous. <laughs> would a civilian man in Roman Britain display a big F off phallus on his am uh, amulet on his horse if he didn't have a military background? These amulets suggest not. There are many amulets related, not related to horses dating to the period of the civilian town. Children are well represented. Uh, little bells worn at the wrist protected children against the evil eye. Uh, animal tooth pendants also protected against the evil eye and were used for teething problems. The best evidence for men that isn't horse related is this security seal for a money bag rather than a seal box for documents, which has a phallus uh, on the lid. <clears throat> but for women, the amulets are quite different and not conclusively related to fear of the evil eye. These jet pendants are mental amulets, one in the form of a breast to promote lact lactation, another depicting a scalp shell, a reference to the uterus and childbirth, and one in the form of a lower leg and foot. While these are not images that specifically protect against the evil eye, it is quite possible that the illnesses treated by these amulets were believed to have been caused by the evil eye. I spoke of the decoy eye strategy in the context of the civilian horse mounts. There is a further large group of objects that I am interpreting as decoy eyes. There are 105 of these plaster eyes from the Baz Basilica excavation. These are fallen fragments of wall plaster, each chosen because they already resembled an eye in their shape, the presence of a pupil, and a tear duct. They were then modified on the reverse side so that they would sit comfortably in the hand. They come in a range of sizes, and many occur at the smaller end and were presumably for children. <clears throat> Maybe I'll go back a bit. The plaster eyes were previously interpreted as anatomical ex votos and taken as evidence for a local shrine for healing eye complaints. Anatomical votives were much more common on the continent than here. Oops. And we see here a group of anatomical votives deposited at the sacred healing site of Ponte di Nona near Rome, uh, including, which included a single eye. 
Objects like these ceramic models were mass produced and sold at the various shrines, specifically to be deposited usually into a body of water by those seeking a cure. Eyes occur in one other form at Roxeter. These two paired eyes in sheet metal, one in gold, the other copper alloy. These were also described in the published reports at the time as votive objects. However, they, these have evidence of having been attached to a rigid backing and are much more likely to be medical amulets which were worn around the neck. Overall, the medical amulets are clear group, <coughs> but are very much in the minority compa compared to anti-evil eye amulets. None of these eye-shaped objects excavated from Roxeter that I've shown you were recovered from a context that might have been associated with ritual deposition. Instead, they're from a wide, ra wide range of contexts and dates. The excavators suggested that they were all in secondary contexts, but a factor that argues against these eyes being votives is the near absence of the wider range of votive object types you would expect to see. For example, little model objects such as axes or decorative sheet metal plaques. I am then reinterpreting the plaster eyes as amulets to protect against the evil eye and the paired eyes as medical amulets. I suggest that in Roman Britain, unlike the continent, a single eye usually refers to the evil eye, but a pair of eyes is <coughs> more likely to be a medical amulet. Do these eyes exist elsewhere? They do. There is a small group of the wall plaster eyes from South Shields, and there are other single eye amulets and other materials. Uh, that one is made of Samian, that's from Roxeter. Uh, this is from Canterbury. This is a, a, a section of, of antler, which um, is described as having an unfinished perforation. Uh, there's a shirt from a face jar from Manchester with an eye. Um, this is one of the one of the Roxeter ones. If we were looking, I think we would probably see more of these, these unfinished objects, found objects, slightly modified objects that resemble an eye. <coughs> these found or modified amulets lead me on to the question of organics, a category that has the potential to be very large numerically and at the same time almost invi invisible archaeologically. Um, the far slide is a picture of rue. This is a plant that was introduced into Britain in the Roman period. This was recommended by Pliny as protection against being cursed, and sprigs of it were worn around the neck. Uh, I have to admit, there is no evidence from rocks that are for Rue, but um, uh, it, it, nonetheless, it is an introduction in the Roman period. The found objects from Roxeter include some of the most usual finds. The many fragments of human bone recovered from Roxeter, these are just a few, there are over 100. Um, specifically, these are the easily detachable parts, like the fingers and toes, um, and at the very, the, those of the very highest value, fragments of skull, which is the, the, the pieces on the right. Other softer body parts, such as ears, noses, and genitals, would not survive archaeologically, but would certainly have been used. All these body parts are mentioned in descriptions from antiquity as basic ingredients that which is obtained from paupers' graveyards. These fragments could have been used in composite protective amulets contained in a pouch, as well as a range of other spells. The main paid work of witches was the preparation of spells for erotic magic. I suggest that what we see in the group of plaster eyes are the kind of amulets not usually seen archaeologically, those available to and used by the widest range of the Romano British population, those who couldn't afford to buy the, the amulets made by specialist manufacturers. I think this group of over 100 plaster eyes gives us the previously unrecognized bottom half of the social pyramid in terms of amulet possession and suggests that the superstitious belief in the evil eye was probably universal and that taking steps to defend oneself against it was a powerful motivating force among the people of Roman Britain. And there I'm stopping.